Stephanie Smith has been a longtime Eagle Forum board member, and she has, she's just an amazing person. She was an action group leader for the Birmingham Hoover area. Unfortunately, she left us, but she left us to become CEO of Alabama Policy Institute, and she's doing a fabulous job. We love her. She was going to speak today about what needed to be included into a good school choice bill to allow freedom for parents, but to also have the transparency and the, the accountability. Well, we got a call from her this morning. She had an emergency come up and she was not able to be with us. But one of her right hand ladies from Alabama Policy Institute who's working with them, Sheila Bannister, she is in the Republican women's world. And so many of you may know her already. She's got some of Stephanie's notes and then I'm going to tag team along with her when she's finished because I've read through the governor's new educational savings account bill and I will tell you what I know about it and how we feel about it at this point. So again, uh, please welcome Sheila Bannister from API. Thank you and um, I appreciate this opportunity to, to chat with you guys. Uh, and Stephanie would have done a much better job. She's been doing this a lot longer than me. Um, but it's, it's been really fun to work with API. I just started working with them uh, in December um, on school choice and just um, working with uh, getting this done. And I just wanted to share just a short brief uh, about me and how I got involved. Um, so I, about five years ago, we, we moved to Alabama. I live in North Alabama in Madison. My husband is re, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, retired in the U.S. Air Force. And so North Alabama was a, a, a logical place for us to go for him as a career. And we thought it was a great place to raise our daughter, who is now eight years old and in the third grade. So five years ago, um, moving to Madison, I was told that the schools were most excellent, the best in the state. And then I started hearing other things from the people who actually live there. And so I started getting more, just more and more involved. And so um, researching, trying to lobby for changes. Um, I ran for Alabama House District 4 uh, two years ago. That was a great learning experience. I ran on a heavy education platform. Um, I'm very passionate about it. and. Uh, Amen to the people who've been talking about education. I could tell you more and more horror stories about things because I have people call me on a weekly basis about things that they're seeing their kids um, having to face in the public schools with these new programs, especially since COVID. Um, we made the decision to put our child in, in private school, and so she's attending there. But as someone who comes from a long family of not only educators, but people in the public service, I feel like I still have a responsibility to help our neighbors and the people across our state to protect children and families. And so I'm just really appreciative of that opportunity um, to work with API. And so um, I know most of you guys are pretty well educated and know what's going on. Um, in the education world and especially with education funding. But first and foremost, I think um, from API standpoint is there's a paramount question that we have to answer um, in our communities and across our state. And that is who knows what's best for their children? Is it the parents or is it government? And API agrees, it is the parents. And because of that, uh, the parents should be able to choose who their partners are in educating their children. And it, unfortunately, which I think all everything or most things that we start in life always have really great intentions. And public schools aren't bad. The concept of public school is not bad. School choice includes public school. It's part of a choice. Um, however, public schools have become the monopoly across the United States and has for some time. And so, uh, API believes that we should have agency, parents, grandparents, guardians should have agency in choosing who their partners are to educate students. Um, and so that is why API strongly supports school choice legislation. Now one of the things that your legislatures will tell you is that well, we already have school choice. We've had school choice for a long time in um, Alabama. And while that is technically true, 
in, in practice, it's not true. Um, so we have a couple of different programs. We have, we have public schools. We have some magnet schools within the public school system that focus typically on music and STEM programs. We have the Accountability Act, which is a tax, um, actually, I gotta look at my notes. I always get these two uh, mixed up. Um, yeah, the Accountability Act, which is uh, the AAA program. So, and that impacts about 6% of the students across the state. And we, then we have the Education Scholarship Program that um, impacts less than 1% of the students across the state. We also have charter schools. So we had charter school legislation that was passed roughly 12 years ago. Um, and unfortunately, unlike other states, we only have 17 charter schools across the state to date. Um, a lot of other states, when they implemented their uh, charter school legislation, charter schools um, were, they just took off. Um, in North Alabama, for example, which is where I'm most familiar with what's going on in education, uh, there's no charter schools north of Birmingham. So charter schools are not even an option in North Alabama. And so while we have technically on the book school choice, that's not really school choice for all in the state of Alabama. So then you have your option of you can, as a parent, um, take on an additional expense in, in addition to your taxes that you already pay in for education to then take on additional expense and, and either homeschool your child or send them to private school. Um, so. Also, another thing that a lot of people will tell you is that if you uh, have universal school choice, which is what API promotes, you will destroy the public schools. Good. And um, <laughs> and and or they'll either say that or they'll say, well, it's too new of a concept. Um, we need to wait and see how it works out other places. That's simply untrue. The modern day school choice programs have existed since the 90s. Um, and so they've been around for quite some time. Um, and it doesn't destroy the schools. The schools. Um, a lot of teachers are the uh, opinion that it actually could alleviate a lot of the pressures on the schools with having more educational options. You'll have lower class uh, student to teacher ratios. Um, also, if you look at other states where school choices have, uh, programs have been implemented, you don't see this mass exodus. Um, we as human nature, we don't really like change, and so most of us aren't early adopters, so it will take a lot of time for some people to move on, and you don't, you don't see a lot. I think Arizona, if I'm remembering correctly, was the first the state that had the biggest exit, and even that wasn't uh, more than about 10%. Um, so you're not you're not seeing this max mass exodus that would eliminate um, major funding from the schools or even major student exit from the schools. Um, the third one is it hurts teachers um, that we're going to take all the funding from the teachers. So um, Alabama historic in the last five years since uh, Governor Ivey has been in office as governor, Alabama teachers have had a pay raise every single year. <coughs> and she proposes that we'll have another pay raise this year. We hear from the legislature, at least every legislature I've talked to in the last three years, has said, well, teachers are exiting because they don't get paid enough. And I would challenge that that's not true either. Teachers are exiting because there's no discipline in the classroom. Yes. Teachers are exiting because they're forced to teach students things that are not appropriate for their age and or go against their values. Teachers are finding other options to teach or other careers that are more meaningful to them and they're not forced to do other things. So the notion that we don't pay our teachers enough in the state of Alabama is simply not true. Um, our teachers um, are actually, we're ranked 26th across the nation in student pay. Um, when I do that math, we're right in the middle. Now, wouldn't it be amazing if our student scores were also right in the middle, yeah. but we're in the bottom 10 and have been, regardless of budget record numbers in the ETF funding. Last year alone, we had over a $2 billion surplus in ETF funding. We expanded more programs within schools with the Literacy Act and the Numeracy Act. I talked to a teacher earlier this week. She teaches in the Hunt School City um, schools, and she was talking to me about the Literacy Act. And she said, it, the, the Literacy Act is a joke because all it does is lower the standards so that more kids pass. Not teaching kids how to read, 
but just making it so that they can pass them on to fourth grade, ill-equipped to face the future, ill-equipped to succeed in high school and middle school, um, let alone when they get to adulthood. Um, and she actually told me how well she gets paid in the Huntsville City Schools. And that's why she sends her child to private school, <laughs> same private school that my daughter goes to, and, but she continues to teach. Um, and, and so she, she had a lot more to say. Um, we were supposed to be there on a social visit, but we ended up talking all about the schools. Um, so, so there's a lot of uh, un, untruths about that. So here we are. We're seeing it across the country, school choice, specifically ESAs are being the big push. ESAs are educational savings accounts, and if you're not familiar with those, those are a type of funding tool that is used to enable agency for parents to choose how their kids are, are educated. And they vary, the way these programs are executed, they're very, they vary from state to state. Um, and so you just really have to look at the legislation to see how they're set up and what they do but in essence how they're supposed to work is similar i like to uh, compare it to similar like a health savings account where you set aside pre-tax dollars to help with your health care it's similar um, in that tax dollars are set aside um, and these are specifically a portion of tax dollars that would have gone to the public school had your child gone to the, the uh, zip code school they're assigned to and um, so there it's you can it depends on the like i said it depends on the legislation but most of these programs you have to opt in for and then an amount would go to that account that can be used to educate your child usually depending on the state homeschoolers and private schoolers can um, access the funds when they opt in and how they're executed depends on how it's set up some are run through their state department of education um, some are run through the department of revenue um, and they have access to those dollars so just to remind you how um, public education is funded it's funded through uh, mostly three sources your local tax dollars your state tax dollars and federal tax dollars so your local ta uh, tax dollars would stay in your local schools the state tax dollars is what we're talking about, so a portion of that state tax dollars would then follow the student. And then the federal dollars would stay the same as well. Um, so we're only talking about a portion of the state tax dollars. In most um, plans that I've read and I'm familiar with, um, it's only a portion of those state tax dollars. So a portion of the state tax dollars would still remain in the local schools, um, but a significant amount would uh, follow the student to where they go. Um, so, as you know, um, or hopefully you heard Tuesday night when the governor gave her State of the State ad address, she has just dropped this week the Choose Act, which is her version of the ESA account. If you've been following Eagle Forum for a while, you are aware of the Price Act that was last year. Um, and so this is the Choose Act um, this bill is going to be sponsored by um, Arthur Orr in the Senate, and it's co-sponsored by um, Garrett in the House. I was a little surprised, but um, the governor announced that um, uh, Speaker Ledbetter is co-sponsoring in the House. Um, when I've talked to him before, he hasn't been a, a fan of them. Um, but And then Reed, uh, Senator Reed is co-sponsor. Um, in the Senate. So it's the CHOOSE Act, which stands for Creating Hope and Opportunity for Our Students. Um, so it's a, a refundable tax credit, which is an ESA account, and it would start in the 25-26 school year, um, and the 2026-27 school years are um, the, kind of the, two, the first two pilot years, and it would only be available for families with income up to 300% of the federal po poverty level, which is approximately $90,000 adjusted gross income for a family of four. Um, and then in the 2027 20, and 2028 school year and beyond, it would be universal, meaning all families could participate regardless of income. The priority will go to special needs students first with the first 500 and then prior participants and siblings. 
and then it would be income based. So as I said, it would start in 2025 and um, you would find it's up to $7,000 per child enrolled in an accredited participating schools. So schools have to agree to participate as well as the parent or the families have to agree to participate. So it's a it's an 100 percent opt in program. Anyone not comfortable with the program does not have to participate. Um, and then for homeschoolers, they have up to $2,000 per homeschooler with a $4,000 cap for families with two or more homeschoolers. Um, just over 14,000 students funded eligible or it's only 1.9% of the amount of students that we have in the state. Um, there's no language that claims credit um, with a tax return. So there's no tax return credit on this. Um, also, it's, it's important to know that this is a program for parents, not taxpayers, broadly. Um, so the use is, it's super flexible. Um, to, you, it pays for tuition and fees at participating schools, textbooks, after school or summer programming at participating schools, instructional materials, education software, services for students with disabilities from a licensed or accredited practitioner, tutoring services, um, unbundled services, courses at public schools, it can pay for curriculum, fees for nationally standardized um, norm reference tests, tests as well as prep, te or prep courses, AP exams, college admission exams, um, but transportation is not included. So it is uh, administered by the Department of Revenue um, and as a refundable income tax credit. And the, the Department of Revenue may hire a third party to help administer the program. So the funding stream states that the annually the legislator, legislature shall appropriate not less than $100 million to newly established um, Choose Act fund. So my understanding is that's a floor. It's the minimum requirement. Um, also, the unused program funds will stay in the fund. They will not be reappropriated anywhere else. They're using $50 million uh, is set aside for the Choose Act fund in FY 2024 as ETF supplemental. So that will come out of the ETF this year. Um, Okay, so school requirements. They must be accredited or in the process or in process of public or private schools. So they have to be in the process or already accredited um, to qualify the expenses. They cannot discriminate based on race, color, or national origin. Um, school regulations, they must comply with privacy, occupancy, and health and safety codes. They have to prove uh, financial solvency. They do have a testing requirement. It says standardized assessment aligned to the curricula of the participating school, a nationally normed reference achievement assessment, or a nationally recognized aptitude assessment of the participating school choice. Test results are not reported to the state or publicized. So testing required, schools get to choose what kind of te testing that they take. They have to report to the Department of Revenue that it's taken, but not the detailed data of the test results. Um, so schools have to apply to be a part of it. They have to submit quarterly reports. We talked about the discrimination. They have to agree uh, to FERPA, which I'm unfortunately not aware of. Um, so parents' requirements. So parents must agree to follow the program rules, including qualifying expenses. They have to submit necessary information to the treasurer for implementation. They can't enroll their kids in a public school and they may use their own money for expenses not covered by the credit. Um, and they can use the credit for only, for the, they can only use it for the child that's been approved. Um, so I think I went over that. Um, the, Reven the Department of Revenue is responsible for onboarding schools. I mean, some of this is really just technical on how they're going to um, lay it out. But on accountability, a lot of people talk about accountability and um, schools can be ro uh, randomly audited um, as well as the vendors. Um, parents who violate rules may lose their credit. Um, they can be suspended or disqualify providers who don't follow the program rules. And they may recapture or deny credits for any unauthorized expenses. 
So there's built-in pro uh, protection for private schools and autonomy written in the bill. So I just went over very, very quickly the bill. I don't know if Becky, you wanted to say anything more about the bill, but. Okay, we'll give you a great hand for a wonderful synopsis on the fly. <laughs> She had no idea that she was going to be doing that today. So, and you covered all the points I was going to talk about, except two. And if you don't have questions, feel free to come light up. Many of you who are the following Eagle Forum to know that we brought forth the Price Act last year, which stands for Parental Rights and Children's Education, which was a universal savings account bill. We were very excited about it. Um, I want to, again, point to the main author, Margaret Clark, but there, her husband, they worked so hard on that bill. It was a great bill. What I'm so proud of all of you for, some of you helped Eagle Forum, some of you helped win Rome, the Republicans on a mission. Um, there was a lot of um, momentum behind that bill, and I just want to pat all of you on the back. It's really hard to get a massive bill that is so transformative passed in one year. I mean, it's, it's really unheard of. But you guys, last year we had it in the Senate we had enough votes to get it passed in the Senate of a huge bill that would really transform the state. So that is you guys that did that. Now, they didn't bring it to the floor for a vote, but we had the votes and a lot of publicity. Becca um, was amazing with her graphics that she helped us pass out things to legislators and she was phenomenal. You were a huge part of our success. So thank you, Becca. Thank people you. have asked me, and I'm sorry for taking the time, but people have asked me, are we going to break the price act back again? And I want to say, no, not at this point. We were waiting to find out what the governor's bill looks like, because of course, whose bill's going to go? But the governor's bill is going to move probably. Now, if it was a formal bill, we probably would ask, and our sponsor wanted to bring it forth if there was a bad bill. Right now, we're enjoying, we're liking what we're seeing in this bill. And to reiterate, parents that want to send their child to a religious school or a private school, it has to be an accredited school. Now, most of those schools already test. Folks, schools test. And so all this is requiring is that if you are a student using this, these funds, you have to use whatever test that school is using. No big deal. They're doing that already. What's cool about this, and this is what we were worried about, but the governor in her bill if you are a homeschooled student, you're not in a participating school. You are a homeschooled student. There is no testing requirement for homeschool. This is easy. <laughs> now, we do have some questions about the mechanics of it. We want to clarify some things. So we are not API, I know right now, and Eagle Forum, we are not endorsing the bill yet. We are really liking what we're seeing, and we will keep you informed shortly and we will offer amendments to make it better. But we're off to a really good start. I'm, I'm happy with what I'm seeing. Okay, Stuart. Hey, um, pardon me for not being very um, optimistic about the people driving this problem. I'm excited that you're excited. <laughs> uh, <laughs> send it on. Does uh, Arnold or Bill have any insight into anything that is different about the um, about this one compared to the price and two points two uh is the seven thousand dollars the maximum amount that a school can charge the family okay good and the other one that think needs to be on everybody's radar going forward as a doctor is does this is this some way going to capture the own school school students in vaccination enforcement no no to the vaccination as it stands now no um okay the difference between the big difference between the price act and this bill the price act would take the the state portion schools get money from the feds from the state from the local the price act would take the money from the state seven thousand dollars you give it to an account that the parent would use from kid this is a tax credit you have to apply for a tax credit this is different this we actually like this better this this is a good thing so it is it, that's the main difference um it's still going to run by the Department of Revenue, like the price that is very similar, but I actually think in some ways it might be better. And if it's making the homeschoolers feel more comfortable. Come up. Okay. I just had one red flag and all that, and it's really just because I don't know. What are the requirements 
uh, in order to be an accredited school because I thought in the past I've had heard that the teachers actually have to be certified in the area that they're teaching and I don't know I just I, I think that could phase out some private schools in a hurry because a lot of times the teachers are not teaching in an area that they have a degree in. Can I answer that? Yeah, okay, so good question, great question. This will keep a lot of good private schools out of the mix because they, some are not accredited, some don't have all the rules. So those schools would either change and become accredited or they just won't participate and parents will just still pay for it out of their pocket. That's how that's gonna work. Uh, there are six accrediting agencies that Alabama schools use. So the school can pick which accrediting agency they want to go under, and maybe there's some that aren't quite as tight as others, and they could go that direction. But you have to be in one of those accredited associations to be able to participate. Yeah. And that can change over time. They can add different things. And this is just getting our foot in the door. I shouldn't say our, getting the foot in the door. Okay. Curious, why is it do we have so few charter schools? Caveat. We've had two or three people down in Baldwin County talk to us about how difficult their findings, the process to get a charter school. So, I mean, I'll just give you, and Becky probably might have no more about this, but my understanding is, especially when the law was first implemented, it happened. So, maybe all I need to say is that the Department of Education runs it. <laughs> uh, but it is planned through the Department of Education, and it was very, very difficult. Um, based on the rules and regulations to get it started. Um, I know they've gone back several times, even just as early or as, as recent as last legislative session to make that easier. But also something to understand about charter schools, charter schools usually start with K through three. They take a lot of upfront funding. So um, I talked to Emily Schultz who has run as one of the charter school organizations. She said that usually if you have the money in hand, which usually is a minimum of several million dollars, it'll take two years to get it started. And then it's just K through and three. So it, it's a slow go with, with charter schools. That is the main answer there is if you have to have a private person comes to make a charter school, they have to have the funding up front. They do not get paid until the doors are open. So they can't, they can't, they have to pay the teachers, all the prep work, everything they have to do out of their pocket. They don't start receiving money until school starts and the doors are open. And that's the problem. So there was legislation last year that would allow some pre-funding to go to these good schools. And then as soon as the doors are open and they're rolling in the money, they pay the money back. It was a great bill. It needs to happen. Hopefully they can get going this year. That's what I follow up question. What can we help do? Yeah. So we'll keep our eyes on that if it comes back again. But these these good people like Hillsdale College, they're starting these charter schools. Well, you gotta have the money up front. So this bill would really help them if we could get that passed. So Barbara Drummond, Democrat Mobile, um, was interviewed on TV and she asked the question, what keeps the schools from going up in their prices? Oh, it's bad. Okay. That's your question. Do you like okay. That is a great question. So you want to answer that? Or, well, I mean, I don't know that it does. Um, for instance, this, the, so my daughter goes to Lindsay Lane Christian County, which is out of Limestone County, which is where we live. Um, when we started there back during COVID, she was in kindergarten, which is why I wanted her in school and not online. Um, they promised not to ever raise uh, more than seven percent a year. We have had an increase every single year. Um, but when I talked to the headmaster there, he said, really, for a school like ours to be operating optimally, they need ten thousand dollars a year per student. Um, we're only paying we're paying under six thousand or under seven thousand right now. Uh, per student at Let's Lane. So I don't think it necessarily will keep the cost down, especially if it's a private school who's already <coughs> operating underfunded. Um, but maybe you have something better. Yeah, one of the things to mention about that is that it's the free market. When they know that funds are going to be available for their schools, they're not going to be, some may jack their prices up, but most of them are going to be competing for the students. And so there will be a free market aspect to it to keep the prices down. But if they're only charging three thousand dollars now, and they can get seven, some of them are probably going to raise it, and that's you know that's the three market. That's what happens. Well, and one thing that you know I talked to the head of master about too is that if this goes into effect, like they can't raise tuition to ten thousand dollars in one year because 
most of the families in our school aren't even going to qualify until year three of implementation. So you will price almost your entire student body out of the school before the program has been fully implemented. And I think they're aware of that and are, you know, keep an eye on that too. I don't think most schools want to lose their already uh, loyal families. All right, last question. So Another great AG leader, action group leader, thank you for being here. So I do want to emphasize that comment before I go to my question is that, yes, we actually probably need to be proactive with our homeschools. I mean, our homeschools, but our private schools to say, because I believe that's why college education is so expensive is because of federal aid. If they know they're getting that much, that is the parent can give that much more. And so, I, I mean, I'm spending $50,000 a year on tuition. Thank you, federal aid. And so I think we'd be aware of that. Yeah, absolutely. But that's not the point. The question that I have is a little more related to homeschoolers. Um, what's the, the mechanism or the regulation involved and how do they get that money? What can they pay for it? And does that uh, it come with any strings attached? I can answer my answer is this is why we're not endorsing the bill yet. There are a lot of details that we need to know and that aren't specified in the right. bill. So that's a great, we don't know. We don't, yeah. we don't so know. The list of what they can use it for is very high level at this point. And so I think we're going to have, there's going to have to be more discussions about that. Uh, but I think... Yeah, there's just more questions that need to be asked about it. Okay, one more quick question. Well, I have two questions, so be short. <laughs> okay, so I, I just am, um, I'm excited about some of the things that I'm here to build, like Becky, and then again, like Stuart, who, I mean, Dr. Tangsley, and whatever. Um, but I just find it very disappointing that some mothers give up an $80,000 a year job to homeschool their four children, and they devalue the value of that mother that's educating four children and toss them a $2,000 a child, it's not right. And so, you know, in my mind, as soon as I saw that, it was like, okay, well, yeah, but see, we gave you testing. So does that make it right that you're going to give us the testing and then take our money away from us? So that's not you. Yep. Me too. Okay. And the testing maybe is not that in important to you it really is the amount of money because the child's no different the child's getting educated but you're willing to give two thousand dollars a year and let them not take tests but you're not really willing to give them what they deserve to get as a home score okay so the answer my answer to that is i agree with you i want homeschoolers to be on the same universal i want them to all be getting the same thing but to me like I said, this is getting your foot in the door. The legend, it will never pass the legislature if you gave them the same amount. It just won't. We would love it to. So you get your foot in the door and it starts off with 2000 Next year, it's 3000 Pretty soon they see how great the program's working and hopefully we would all want it to be equal. Okay, one out of two. We could add that. That was my second question. Yeah, is that an amendment? Though, that yes, it could add? definitely be an amendment. Absolutely. So and I think someone has written an, a resolution. Okay, I got a legislator raise his hand back there. Yes, that definitely can be. Okay, Sheila, we give you great thanks for yeah. doing this on the clock. Because <laughs> the teachers union and the retirement system rsa they are already out to kill this mill and anything like it not even 24 hours after the governor talked about this my phone was blown out of asking me questions for clarification on the bill because of emails that are already coming out um so be educated read the bill share with your neighbors and friends we need to liberate our kids and if you didn't know that before the presentations in front of me should have convinced you of it. Thank you. Amen. Thank you so much. Okay.